Have you seen Maria Dizia? We knew that this was a beautifully written, beautifully constructed play, but to watch Maria Dizia come on stage was breathtaking. Absolutely breathtaking. I want to be a producer with a hit show on Broadway. You're listening to the Producers Perspective Podcast with your host, Tony Award winner, Ken Davenport. Yes, that was a Bob Dylan tune, and yes, Bob Dylan's tunes are in a Broadway musical this season. That was Girl from the North Country. You can check it out playing right now at the Belasco Theater. We have one of the producers, Diana Demena, on today's podcast. She's going to tell you all about Girl from the North Country, as well as what the Constitution means to me and all the shows she's produced and how she picks them. But let's hear a little Dylan before we get there. Enjoy. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Producers Perspective Podcast. My name is Ken Davenport. I'm thrilled to be with you today. I hope you're enjoying our new spring season, and I hope you're enjoying the Broadway spring season. There are a lot of new shows to see right now. The Tony race is already heating up. Hopefully, it's giving you a break from that presidential race. It's also heating up. Uh, My guest today has a horse in that race, not the presidential one. Maybe. Who knows? We'll find (laughs) out. But in that Tony race, she is one of the producers of Girl from the North Country, please. Please welcome to the podcast, producer Diana Demena. Welcome, Diana. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So Diana has been a producer on a bunch of shows on Broadway, from Natasha Pierre to Network. Uh, for me, and one of the things we're really going to dig in today, I want to hear a lot about uh, what the Constitution means to me, which she was a lead producer on last season, a big surprise hit, and such a great story on and off the stage. Uh, so tell me, Diana, why theater producing? Why did you even say you wanted to get into this crazy side of the business? <laughs> and it is crazy. Um I, I, my, I have the heart of a storyteller at the bottom of everything I do is really the story. And so in that theater and live theater and Broadway theater remains that sort of last temple to in-person community storytelling. Uh, it was probably inevitable that I was going to find my way to Broadway. I've worked in film, I have some TV projects, but it really for me is about the stories that we get to tell and the way we get to tell them in community, live and different every time, every show. I think that's the allure. And is that why you, I assume, like theater more than film or TV? I'm always fascinated by people who do a little bit of everything, but gravitates more towards the theater, which admittedly, is not the highest paying of them, the easiest to get on with limited theaters, all those things. So why are you attracted to the more difficult entertainment medium? It's the live audience experience, definitely. You know, in our culture, we we don't have religious institutions as a gathering place anymore. People don't have community center. You know, we, we really are very, very isolated and coming together Together to share a common experience in a single place still has that sort of spiritual nature to it. Um, nobody ever knows what's going to happen. You don't know the people to your left and right, and yet you're sharing sometimes a very dramatic and emotional experience. And so I think that theater is sort of my church, and I think it is for a lot of other people. And so I think that collective gathering for shared experience really is, it's its not replicable in any of the other areas in which I'm interested. Yeah. I i always say the same thing. You don't know that person to your left or right. And what's amazing about the theater is they could be a different gender, a different race, a different sexuality. And when a show is great, they're both bawling their eyes out. They're both laughing no matter how different they may be. Exactly. And finding common ground, um, I think you did mention the political environment and the political race. Um, we need to find common ground and we need to notice our sameness far more than our differences. And that is, I think, the the secret to being part of a live audience is that we are all there 
maybe from very different experiences, but we're sharing that one common thing and our humanity causes shared responses. Um, and it doesn't really matter whether the person next to you is known to you, familiar to you, looks like you. We're all having a human experience and very often that's shared. I mean, I could have that that response could have been given on a debate stage, frankly. <laughs> one of the, so that, it's true. Theater and politics have a lot more in common than we thought. So, uh, tell me your path to becoming a lead producer. So, obviously, that is the pinnacle and what the Constitution means to me. Uh, you had that last uh, season, but you were involved as a co-producer before that, mm-hmm. right? So, tell me how you got started and how that led you to be a lead on what the Constitution means to me. Sure, um, I. Can't came to commercial theater from the nonprofit arts realm. Um, I had spent 10 years working on arts education and the needs of children and sort of wherever they intersect from the nonprofit perspective. And I had sort of set a, a, a kind of a time frame, personal time frame for myself. Um, when my kids got to be a certain age, I was going to go sort of back into the workforce in a commercial way. And so right around the time that my nonprofit work uh, was winding down, I got an opportunity to go to a couple of readings of new plays. And I thought, oh, this is what all of that nonprofit work had prepared me for. And it it's that the skill set that one needs in order to get work done in the nonprofit sector is very similar. Same leadership qualities, um, the same sense of purpose and drive. Um, there's always a greater good. So whether it's building a children's history museum or a um, you know music center for classical musicians, there's a constituent. There is an artist or a group of people for whom you are advocating. And that advocacy and leadership, uh, those are the same skills that I think you need to be a lead producer. And so I was able to take a lot of the experiences advocating for artists and projects in the nonprofit realm and then be able to say, okay, so how does this work in commercial theater? So I came in with a lot of questions. I knew what I didn't know, and I was able to uh, find a few other producers who were willing to let me learn. I presented myself to a handful of producers and said, if I were your intern, you know, what would that look like? Will you teach me how to do the commercial part of this? Um, And so a few very generous people gave me some time. And I humbled myself to ask for help and say, hey, I know how to do this in the nonprofit realm, but I have no idea what these numbers mean or these contracts. And it is a very, very labyrinthian and and arcane business. Um, I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. I, you know, I've been, I've been doing this long enough now that I don't find myself saying, wait, we do what? We, we do, we do, why do we do it that way? I've, uh, I'm on prescription medication to get me from yeah. stop saying that, yeah, actually. I know. I, I, I really realize how long I've been doing this and the fact that I'm not shocked now when I realize things about our contracts. And um, yeah. So it what's took- the most surprising? What's, when you started doing this, or still today, <laughs> what's the most surprising thing you saw that you were like, what the? F is that? Um, okay, it always has to do with contracts. I'm, I was I was gobsmacked to discover that the APC contract is as many decades old as it is, and again, not dissimilar to politics and what the Constitution means to me, which is is the underlying document flawed, and does that need a total replacement, or are all of the sort of addendums and clauses and amendments? sufficient. So I was really surprised to discover really how archaic our contracts are. And probably the fact that so many of them go unsigned. That I'd never, ever heard that. And and if one more (laughs) agent says to me, oh, don't worry about it. I don't think, you know, so-and-so 
great famous Broadway musical theater performer. I don't think she signed her contract from insert name of show in the 80s. Um, yeah, I don't care. I, I would like contracts signed. Um, when you come from the outside and you do business in a certain way, I'm always surprised at how arcane the contracts are and then how um, casual everyone is about them. That was a big surprise to me. Yeah, it's a crazy... I think I can count... Like, I think I have three or four outstanding contracts from shows that have closed that right. are still have not been executed at this point. That's insanity. Yeah, it drives right? us nuts. And that, then it bites us. Mm. Listen, I was one of the co-producers on the infamous Jeremy Piven Speed the Plow. Ah. And I don't believe that contract was ever executed by the time he got his quote-unquote mercury poisoning that prevented him from continuing on with us. Right. So it does it does bite back, yeah. Yeah, contracts are important and I really do think that while there are some very charming kitschy industry things, that's not one of them. That's actually something that we should do better. Um is that contracts matter and they protect us, they protect artists and they also protect relationships. I treasure my relationships in this business and I want them to be always clear, clean, and above board. And contracts are kind of how the rest of the world does that. So I would love to see all of us really use contracts for what they're for, which is to make things clearer and smoother and everyone to be better informed. That would be the one thing I would love to see change. So you go to these first few readings, you find yourself seeing these new plays, and uh, you start to look at it through a different lens. So how do you make a decision, ooh, that one? Like, what is your <laughs> personal algorithm, if you will, of like, that's one I want to advocate for. That's one I want to now risk capital, raise capital, get behind and spend the next eight years of my life or so um, it, working It will on. invariably be the largest rock that needs to be rolled uphill. I just pick the really difficult, non-obvious, um, quirky. Yeah, I, it's very funny because there are producers who are so unbelievably good at making these, you know, wildly entertaining, very, very uh, broadly appealing shows. I'm never going to be that person. I, I'm always looking for the untold story, the as yet unheard voice. I want to do the difficult work. I want to do the work people don't initially understand. Um, I would love to do projects like Constitution that people looked at and said, well, that's not commercial or that's not a Broadway show. And recouped in like X, what, how many weeks? Like we returned 150% on the Broadway run alone. I mean, that is phenomenal it's because the limited run, it was how long? 24 weeks. I think we extended to 30, did we get to 30 weeks, 28 weeks? Um, yeah. Yeah. It, it, I mean, Amazon doesn't make that. I mean, Amazon stock did not go up 150% in six months. That's correct. Um, yeah. Those are the shows that I want to do. Um, the ones that Yeah, me people... too. I'd take a few of them myself, <laughs> just you know, on a side note, by the way. Yes. Well, well I'll call you next time. <laughs> um, but the truth is that um, I, I am in some sense still an activist. I mean, I was an activist in the nonprofit sector, and I still think of myself as an activist producer. Um, I want to prove that audiences are there for shows that are not obvious. I want to champion artists whose work necessarily doesn't fit in a box. Um, so I'm always going to be attracted to the more difficult and less obvious sort of nothing's obvious, obviously. Um, but I'm always going to be behind some small quirky show that people don't immediately see the value of. What's a show that you've seen on Broadway in any era that you wish you would have produced? Ooh, gosh, that's such a good question. Um, <laughs> well, if it happened in the last five years, I probably pushed my way onto the producing team, um, which is exactly what I did with Girl from the North Country. I had heard rumblings about it in London. People whose taste I really admire had put it on my radar back when it was not yet on its way here. And then when I saw it at the public, I just camped out on Tristan Baker's doorstep 
until he made room. I was like, I am going to produce this show. Like I have to be on this show because I, this is a show I understand. This show, I get it in my bones. I know why it's great. I know how to talk about it. I know who's going to come and see this show. Um, so chances are, if it was something that I loved that much, I, I probably was on it. <laughs> I don't know that I've missed anything where I thought, oh, I really wish I had done that. So is that, it sounds like you're a pretty tenacious person when you find something that you want. Do you think that's the most important skill that a producer needs to have? So many people come to me like, oh, Ken, what should I learn? Should I go to get my MBA? Should I go you know, study accounting? What do you think is the most important skill that a producer needs to have to be successful today? Passion is definitely way up there, um, but passion is tricky because we we need to love our shows so much in order to champion them. I mean, you have to be just dizzily in love with the show that you're leading and you can't be completely blinded by it. So it is having passion. It's also, um, I guess it's sort of a, a left brain, right brain balance one has to be so unbelievably passionate about this work in order to do it because it's so difficult and so uh, risky. And yet I try to stay grounded enough to hear negative feedback, to anticipate criticism, because if I'm blindly in love with something, I'm not going to make good decisions. So I think it's really a balance of the passion that it takes and then some sense of the wisdom control of those emotions to get the thing done. Is there anything from your history where your passion got the best of you? Because this is actually one of the, the hardest things for, I believe, all of us to do. We love what we do so much, yeah. right? No one is in this business, regardless when unions go on strike and say producers are just greedy. It's like no producer that I know is in this business to make money. We just love right. telling stories and doing great theater. And that's really hard. Because when you love something so much, you will do anything to get the show on, including making bad deals, bad decisions, yep. which is no good for sometimes even the artists involved. You you cut a of bad course. deal, even with them, it's not good for the long for the long run with the show. Any anything that you've I mean, done? I'd love to say no, Ken. I never made a mistake like that. Um, I, I hope that I have not kind of gone so blindly into something that I made bad decisions for myself or the project or the artist. I try to surround myself with people who will tell me the truth. I have trusted colleagues and I ask for feedback and I try to protect myself by, um, look, you can't take everybody's notes. Not everybody's notes are, are really good. Uh, you have to know who your, um, you know, who, you know, you have to know your tribe and so there are people whose feedback and criticism I really value and I ask for it. And then I really try to sit and tolerate how awful it feels to hear it and not defend. I think that the secret is to not love the project so much that, that one is defensive in the face of criticism. And that's, that's the hardest part, but it's the part that I work really hard on so that I don't go blindly down where everyone else can see that X producer is way too in love with their project and that they're not seeing the downsides. We've all watched other people do it. This is me saying, hey, everybody listening to this podcast, don't let me do that. Like, you know, somebody come and give me feedback if I'm blinded to something that is not working on one of my shows. Because it won't ultimately be in service to the show for me to not see those things. So I think we have to ask people we trust to, to tell us the truth. So you camp out on anyone's door when you find you want yeah. to produce a show and say, I'm going to advocate for this. And which translates at some point, if you're lead producing a show, to raising some capital for it, like going out to investors What's your process for that? Do you have a system? Do you like, what do you, um, have you raised money before? Yeah. Yeah. So I try, I try to be incredibly honest, which is to say, 
I start out by saying I have absolutely no idea if this show is going to make money. I'm very happy to tell you or anyone why I believe in a show and why I love it. And I also try to be really clear about the fact that all of this is so highly speculative. So I try not to ask uh, people to invest in shows that I'm not personally invested in. I will always have my own capital at risk on a show, which I think is fair. And I'm I'm probably talk people out of investing more than I talk them into investing because this is money you have to be able to live without. It's just as likely that you're going to get money back from a restaurant, right? The, the failure rate is about the same. So when I bring people in, it has to be because they love what we do and they want to be part of what we do or they love a project as much as I do. I'm in a fortunate position that I don't have to raise all the money. I can always sort of put some of my own capital in and then raise whatever the balance is on Constitution. Yeah, what was that there pitch was, <laughs> like? I want to know how you pitched that show to people. There was so much demand to be part of that show. Really? That I, I ultimately backed my entire personal investment out of that show to make room for other people to be in it. Um, I did the same thing on Kinky Boots. Yep. I had to back it out at the last second. And I'm happy about it because I made some investors of mine some money and they've done more shows. Absolutely. I was happy to do it too um, because then you've actually shared that success with a lot of other people. Um, So you had people clamoring to be a part of that. So tell me, what was it you think they saw that um, made them say, I need to be a part of this right now. Because still, even after the off-Broadway success, it's not like everyone was like, oh, surefire Broadway smash that's going to recoup in 24 weeks and return 150% and tour without Heidi doing it. Right. So what was it about it, do you think? Um, okay. Just one thing before I answer the question, which is, have you seen Maria Dizia? She is a revelation in this show. I mean, we as the lead producers, we knew that this was a beautifully written, beautifully constructed play and that there would be other performers who would make it their own. And and we had no doubt about that. Um, Obviously, we, we sent it on tour with all that confidence. But to go and sit at the taper and watch Maria Dizia come on stage and make this play hers was breathtaking absolutely breathtaking. Did we, you know, did we know exactly how it was going to work? Absolutely not. But we knew it would work. It's knowing in your bones, right? So when when we did the offering for Constitution, we got the theater on Christmas Eve, just a little over a year ago. We found out we got the haze and everyone involved canceled their vacations and we all sat in rooms and papered the entire thing between Christmas Eve and New Year's Day. And it was just like a magic carpet ride. It, everything went so quickly. Um, the yeah, first preview was how long after that? We were in the theater, I want to say, gosh, now you're testing me on dates, which are not my strong suit. I think we were open in seven weeks. That's fast. Yeah, we had to get tickets on sale. No, it, it's it's warp speed. I've never seen a project move this fast um, just to get the ticketing platform built and to get on sale. And what, so talk to me a little bit about that decision to go. Like, was there ever a like, this is effing crazy. We shouldn't do this. Or like, why did you decide to green light it? It was the right thing to do. And we knew it. Um, Did we know it was going to be wildly commercially successful? No. Did we see a path to recoupment? Yes. I have to see a reasonable path to recoupment on a show. And we had an extraordinary budget. Danny Nash made a budget for us that was absolutely watertight. And then we managed to it. And that sounds obvious and simple, but it really was the underpinning of the green light was we knew what it was going to cost. We had a sense that 
we could reasonably recoup and we made we we gave our investors a real shot at recoupment i can't go out and raise money for a show that i really don't believe has a reasonable path and that recoupment chart that's another part of our business that is wackadoo, right? We, you know, there's you you can take five different recoupment charts and they are all different, you know, what they omit and what they include. And so that whole thing of sending out recoupment charts that um, you know, are not perhaps accurate or or are very, very aspirational, that I cannot do. Um, so when we had a path to recoupment on a show that had real momentum in a season that had no plays by women. And we had this thing, this show had something to say. It was an imperative and we all understood that. So once we saw a path to recoupment at the theater that was available to us, there was no going back. Then it was just, and yes, this is effing crazy and let's go. So it wasn't as though we didn't think it was insane. We knew it was insane. and People thought we were insane. But the elements were all there. Like the right elements were actually all there. We had the right house that was the right size. It was, a, you know, it had momentum still from off Broadway. So there was that momentum. Um, and we also, we trust our community, I think. Um, we trusted We trusted our professional community to root for us because it's a little engine that could kind of show. Um, and we also trusted theater goers and we trusted our audience. And it's very interesting because I often feel that audiences will show us how much they actually care about issues, how much they want to support theater. Um, people came out for this show because they felt seen and they felt respected as an audience. Um, we had people come back over and over and over and kept bringing important people. They would come, then they would come back with their sister, their mother, their daughters, their sons. The show had something to say, and we trusted that there was an audience out there that would support the message. And we just had no idea how supportive, but we thought there are enough people who are going to care about this show, and we're going to get a sort of groundswell of support from our peers, which we did. I've never heard it described as a trust, trusting the audience to come out for you before. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. And obviously, it worked. You had a little bit of knowledge, obviously, from the off-Broadway run, mm -hmm. but letting go a bit and saying, no, these people are going to, they're going to come out for us. They are. And we knew they would. We just knew. Um, I think we do need, as producers... I would love to see us spend more time thinking about our audiences as people, thinking about them as more than numbers. Um, yes, if you look at your recoupment chart or any of your projections, you need X number of butts in seats at an average ticket price of Y, and there is math, and it's a formula. On the other hand, I don't think we know our audiences as well as we think we do, or as well as we maybe should. You know, I, I hear it over and over again. There are quotes about, well, the demographic is that it's 65% women. And I'm like, yeah, but who are they? What do they care about? Um, why are they at this show and not that show? I would love to spend more time sort of thinking about audiences differently. And I do think that they are more sophisticated than we give them credit for. And that it is actually okay to take certain risks that presume that our audiences are discerning, intelligent, engaged, thoughtful. I think those, those audiences exist and they come out when we meet them with material that they are interested in. And I'm, I'm really banking on that, but I really do believe that there is that group. You know, people say it's, oh, it's the NPR crowd or it's the this crowd. And I'm like, you know, these are folks and and they have needs and wants and and so to um to silo people like that it's what we're doing in our culture right we're also talking about politics right we're labeling everyone us and them oh well these are the 
you know, flyover states. And, you know, people are all the same. We all want the same things. We may go about them very differently, but that doesn't make your way wrong and my way right. And I think that we have, um, we've really failed in some way to engage our audiences on that kind of human level. We, we talk about them a lot as if they're sort of inanimate, but I think they're not. And I think that when we create work that is specifically for them, they show up. That's, I'm, I'm banking on that because all of my shows are going to be these quirky shows that nobody knows where the audiences are going to come from. So, um, yeah, but I, I do think that there is, um, there's a way in which we, uh, we don't, we don't give our audiences the responsibility for their role. I think that we leave too much of it to sort of this random sense of ticket buyer, generic ticket buyer. I would love to do a better job, uh, maybe in the way that film does, right? We all have been trained to support a film on opening weekend. That industry has told audiences and ticket buyers exactly what their job is and how important they are. So if I am a fan of your film or the actor in your film, I'm going to be standing at the theater on opening weekend because you've told me how important I am to that process. And sometimes I think we don't, um, we really don't give our ticket buyers and audience members the same sense of importance. And yet they are everything. They're everything. And we haven't really engaged them in saying, hey, by the way, here's how it works in our business. And we all, um, all of our marketing is based on making our shows look super successful. That's how we do it, right? But then what happens is everybody assumes your show is running strong and will always be there so they can see it anytime. So we, we, we disincentivize ticket buyers in a way um, in our marketing. And if, if I have to hear one more person say, oh, I meant to see that. Like, well, no, you didn't because you didn't go and you didn't buy a ticket. And I don't know if that's our fault or their fault, you know, but I think there is a disconnect between the way we market our shows as if they're Teflon and they're just oh, all huge hits um, as opposed to sort of letting ticket buyers know how crucial they really are to the industry and to the success of any individual show. I think there's work there. It's, I'm going to write that blog about when the most important time is for an audience to see our show because we do need to educate them on that for sure. Uh, yeah, I, I think we should, and and um, please do, please please run with that because you have uh, you have an outlet and I don't, but I'll help you with the research. You have an outlet now. We're going to get this podcast everywhere. <laughs> you mentioned uh, there weren't many, or what the Constitution was the one of the few plays that uh, year written by a woman. Something that isn't talked about a lot that we did write a blog about, and my associate actually did the research, is we looked at how many female lead producers there were Mm -hmm. and discovered the disappointing statistic that in the previous, I think it was five years or like 28% of the lead producers were women. Uh, You are one of those. So as you got into the business, did you notice any barrier because of your gender? Were things a little bit harder? Is there this old boys club that was preventing you from getting on to a show that you really wanted to get on to or saying maybe this isn't what you should do? Absolutely. And no. Um, yes, there are far too few women in every leadership role on Broadway, full stop. Um, your colleague who compiled some of that research also discovered that shows on which uh, one of three major roles is held by a woman, lead producer, writer, or director. If any one of those three leadership roles is filled by a woman, those shows recoup at a higher percentage than shows where those three roles are led by men. So women are also coming out in the numbers as being slightly more profitable. Yeah, right? It also makes sense. Women buy the theater tickets. This is a statistic we know. So not having that viewpoint seems to be totally the opposite approach we should take. Correct. So was it an impediment for me? No. But I have access to capital. And historically, women and people of color have 
less access to capital than do men and particularly white men. So our industry is not different in that regard, except that, um, you know, we work on a project by project basis. So everyone in our business is fundamentally a free agent, right? And that's, that's kind of cool because then you're moving from one show to another and, um, you know, you always have irons in the fire and things at different points in development. And that's super exciting. But getting into that pipeline is more difficult for women and for people of color simply because they, you know, it requires access to capital. If you want to produce, you have to, you have to either raise or write checks. And so... I think that advocacy has to come in the form of creating access, uh, access to capital and access to uh, leadership rooms for people who do not have easy access to those things. It was not a huge impediment for me because I had capital. Um, had I not, I wouldn't be here. I would not be here sitting talking to you as a successful lead producer had I not come with my own checkbook. That would have been a totally different experience. So what can we do to change that? What can we do to make it easier for my associate, female associate, she wants to be a producer. What can we do to make it easier for her or for all the other people out there that want to do what we now do? Mm -hmm. um, we have to make room at the table. We have to move over. We have to voluntarily cede power, which is shocking. It's a shocking idea for some people. Um, if we want our shows to be more successful, we need to improve the diversity of the groups making the shows. It's not just about uh, social progress. It's actually the quality of the work that we do will be better when more points of view are in the room. We talked earlier about the producer blind spot, right? The passionate producer blind spot. There's another blind spot, which is when everyone in the room is the same. There is a homogeneity blind spot. And um, sometimes shows fail or are not as good as they could be or should be because the people leading them are too similar. And so it's not just the right thing to do for society, the world at large, and our industry. It will actually improve the quality of the work that we make. So what I'm doing is I'm actually investing through other younger producers. So producers of color, young women, I am creating access to capital for them by investing through them rather than investing directly. I don't need to be on a hundred shows. It's not, it's, it's not my leadership style. I want to support people who want to lead other shows. So I think passively investing in these younger people is one of the ways that those of us who can should um, we did it on Constitution. I think that um, we had, I don't even know how many, uh, we had a lot of first time above the title co-producers. Um, we created a lower investment threshold in order to do that so that we had a lot of young people. Um, we had some trans non-binary co-producers. Specific choices were made in the way the offering was done to create a, a price point for access so we have to really think about it and we have to walk our talk. Yeah. So I, I think that we can all find room on our co-producer teams as simple as how many times do you slash names on a line? Is it really going to hurt you to put three names on a line? Is it, you know, those are the places where we have jurisdiction over things and we can be more proactive. Yeah. I love this approach. We've done it on some of my shows as well. And I'm actually a fan of just giving them their own line, which says a lot more, frankly, mm -hmm. at just a reduced price if they meet certain – if they are certain types of people from certain worlds that we know we need more of that they're not going to get the opportunity any other way. I mean, what – why not let them be an above-the-title producer for $50,000 less, $100,000 – $200,000 less? Right. 
especially if they bring other value to it, which is their perspective. I, can't, I, I sit around so many tables where we say like, what we need is to get the young audience here. And then I look around the room and there's no young people in the damn room. That's right. So why not let someone come in for less money just to be able to provide the value of their voice? Yeah. And that those are the tools at our disposal, right? We have the right to do that as producers. Those are choices that we can make. So I'm all for the idea. I mean, look, the above the title number of names has gotten out of control anyway. So it's not the argument against it is, you know, it, I think it's it's antiquated. Um, the idea of, well, how will it look if we have so many names above the title? Well, shows are getting more expensive and it takes a lot more people to row a big show. So I, I think that argument is really not valid. I think we should create as many spaces as we can for above the title producers and not just people who can write big checks, but people who really do make our rooms better and make our projects better. Which leads me to my last question, which I have a feeling I know what the answer is. <laughs> we may have just dove into it already, but I'm going to ask you my genie question, uh -huh. which is I want you to imagine the genie from Aladdin comes to visit you and grants you one wish. So what's the one thing over the past several years of your work on Broadway, we've talked about what drives you a little crazy, but what drives you the most crazy about our industry that frustrates you, that would make you flip up this table, that mm -hmm. you'd ask this genie to wish away in an instant? One thing. Hmm. This is just like the closing moments of Constitution, right? Where the debater and Heidi sit down back to back and say, you know, what would you imagine your life would be like? Um, I would love to find a way to loosen the hold that real estate plays and perhaps have other outlets for the creation of what is Broadway theater. I, I completely understand the limitations of blocks of a neighborhood, particular buildings, there is, there's reason for that to be the way that Broadway works. And that limitation, I think um, it bottlenecks really good work. And I would love to see if together all of us could sit down and figure out, we know that there's a huge log jam, right? We're like, now we're LaGuardia and planes are circling and circling and circling. And there could be really great, great projects on those planes. There might be the next great voice in theater. And we have this log jam that is created by the confines of our industry. I'd love to sit down with everyone, all the stakeholders and say, hey, could we find a way to land a few more planes? Because there might be really important work that is circling and the scarcity, while it works for us in certain ways, I think creatively and in terms of the product that we create, maybe is not healthy. So I, I think it would be that conversation, you know, in total. It's a great answer because I just think about how last season the theater in general and so many audiences members' lives would not be better off had what the Constitution means to me not gotten a theater on Christmas Eve. So it's a great wish. Thank you for it. Thanks uh, for everything you've done for the theater so far and everything you will do. Good luck with Girl from the North Country. Thank Everybody you. out there, go see it. Go uh, see it. You are not ready. You Ooh, are not ready for exciting. how incredible this show is. Uh, I can't wait to see it myself. Thanks to all of you for listening out there. We'll see you next time on the Producers Perspective Podcast. Thanks again to Diana for sitting down with me today. If you're excited about our new season here on the Producers Perspective Podcast, please do me a favor, review us on Apple Podcast. It helps other theater makers and theater fans like you enjoy these conversations. And frankly, it just gets more guests to show up. And that's what we know you want. If you're looking for more theater podcasts, check out Broadway Podcast Network. It's the brand new community and platform for Broadway-themed podcasts and all sorts of other online content. For a peek behind the curtain of a Broadway producer's life, including, frankly, me walking my dog late at night, you can find me on Instagram at Ken Davenport B-Way or check out my blog, theproducersperspective.com. And now you've been waiting for it, this week's hashtag songwriter of the week. 
The songwriters this week are Kinnison and Blair, the duo behind the musical Murder for Two, which was a ton of fun, by the way. Check out their song Happy Birthday, Madeline, with music by Joe Kinnison, lyrics by Kellen Blair, and performed in this recording by Adam Riegler. He was a little Broadway kid when he did The Adams Family. Now he's a full-grown adult and still killing it. Listen to Adam in Happy Birthday, Madeline right now or follow Kinnison Blair on Instagram. Check out their website, kinnisonandblair.com. And we'll see you next week with a brand new episode of the Producers Perspective Podcast. Why didn't you invite me to your stupid birthday, Madeline? Why blatantly omit me from your stupid list of friends? To some, I'm crazy nice. I've never said you suck while you're standing there. Yes, I've mocked you once or twice, but that's the price you pay for the ugly clothes you wear. Why suddenly exclude me from your stupid day full of birthday stupidness? Why was I not invited? Madeline.